will be up on the Lehman Lectures page soon. So that's on YouTube. So I have a YouTube page. If you forget what the YouTube page is, Google will be able to figure it out if you know my name. So you'll be able to find it. Uh, nothing's hidden. It's all public. If you like them so much, you can sit around with your roommates and watch them. So if you like them that much, you can watch them again. So you can tell nobody feels that way by my view. So usually people just kind of chime in, touch a section, scroll, play around with it. The nice thing about this class is I filmed this class last year. So I forecasted COVID. I knew we would be in this situation. We are prepared. Okay, I did forecast the end of the world, but we all did. So this is not it. <laughs> We're going to be okay. Um, I'm a firm believer if we adhere to the, the guidelines, social distancing, masks, when necessary, indoors for sure, absolutely. We're going to be fine. Uh, the experts have spoken, and they believe that this is the right balance. So in terms of an attempt to balance living, education, what we do at the university, why we all came back in the first place, um, and safety, there will be a number of resources like that. So the web page is intact. Um, the YouTube page will be updated ASAP all the time. I just, it wasn't that surprising to me that the computer I tried to upload it on showed on my video. So I need to move to a different point. So I'll get that sorted out. Uh, the web page, some of you work here, is this page that I'll disseminate materials outside of the videos. I just use YouTube for my videos. The reason I like to do it this way is it's persistent. So it continues. And it's not always a changing system. So for me, I like that. So it might not be cutting edge, but it works. Um, of course, the is your link. You'll pick your class. You know where you are. 5444. I usually keep this up for my other classes, so if you like my homework, you can usually go and grab them in advance and start on them early. I've never had a problem with any of that. I've wiped out all days from last year when we started a new class. Um, saying that, the homeworks are bound to change because everything has changed. So I do change them every year a little bit. Um, saying that, I have no problem with people getting ahead. If you want to see what I'm teaching in the spring, you can find it. We did go through the syllabus. We'll note just one more time for safety purposes that we all adhere to the Virginia Tech Wellness Principles. And I don't see why we should. So it seems good to me. So let's all be well and balance every day. So distancing masks, uh, entering and exiting, there's some strategies on this. I'm sure we can all figure that out. And then we move on to the class. So here's some logistics. I'll have review sessions scheduled pretty soon. My schedule's still in flux. So as you can imagine, I have too many meetings. And everybody is changing their meetings on me constantly. And it's worse this year than it was any other year. So we're going to get through it. I'll lock down review sessions. What I'm going to try to do is get my conference room over in my department so I have a whiteboard to work out problems. When you guys ask me to do a problem, you'll probably, if you want me to be prepared, you can watch me be unprepared too. You can still do the problem, probably. Uh, you can ask on the Slack page. So Sierra has sent to everybody um, the Slack information. If you haven't gotten it, if you're using some other email account, it will be in your BT email. If you want us to add some other email to it, Sierra's in the back, she can take care of that for you. Her email information is online, so you can just go there. Uh, the plan is, is to do a midterm and a final. The final will be kind of project I imagine. If we can make it to the midterm date, and I'm not prepared to schedule that right now, but I think next time, We'll pick a midterm date. The idea is we're going to do a 50-minute midterm. 
in class. So it just gives you that experience. So there's something about preparing for a midterm. You think you're going to be tested. I like how much you guys study in those sort of moments, and it gives you a chance to review. Um, so I want to stick with that. If we don't make it to the midterm, I'll figure out something that can be done virtually. Um, the final will be done virtually in some capacity, but it'll probably be a few problems and then a, a project or something like that. A lot of my homeworks have project aspects to it, coding things up right and forth. I usually have in all my classes people do at least two of those. That will be here. We might do one or two more. Um, I know people get a lot out of it. So people seem to like it. When you start the day before, you don't like it. Any other questions about resources and where to find them? There's a special link right here, Schedule, and that has your readings and problems. So Homework Zero is out. You can find that. If Homework Zero gives you a challenge mathematically or you can't figure out how to plot this thing, you're really struggling, um, you need a different class before this one. Um, if it's super simple, it's supposed to be. Uh, I'll give you a hint. The only mathematical thing you need to be aware of is normalizing the posterior distribution. You need your integrating factor in the denominator before you figure out what the expectation is in that little table problem that I have already shown you, but the data looks like this. Back when I was in college, all data looked like this. <laughs> so now it looks big, and you don't even get you have to figure out how to view it and what parts of it you would like to view. But anyway, this is meant to be straight up. If I don't have people say, can I send over a text file with the information column delimited? I'm going to say on this one, no, <laughs> because it's an easy exercise to type in. So not too hard. This is supposed to be easy just to let you know that I do kind of expect that you know what phase is here. Now, if you don't know what it is, uh, I'm going to tell you today. So it is easy enough to do this exercise, even if you didn't know anything before. OK. This is where we were last time. So I'll just remind us, I'll back up one page. that I had done a search on terms like phase or Bayesian. And I wanted to see papers where that term had appeared. So this is my proxy for being a historian. Pretty weak, but there's something here. And I got articles that reference certain years that mentioned Bayesian. And this is kind of a frequency plot of that. So we do know this. The general trend is Bayes didn't start becoming a thing that people were really using and aware of until the 80s, and it really ramped in the 90s. You see this sort of exponential phase of it it's jumping up. I didn't plot it all the way to 2020 because I did this 10 years ago. So this is probably better than if I tried to do this today, because now there's so many articles everywhere. So, um, in 176, back in the, the 1700s, that's where we see the original incarnation of Bayes' theorem. We see papers that are being referenced back to Bayes' original paper, but Bayes did not publish that paper. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, around 1920, student T starts using the term Bayesian. He's a Bayesian. So Dawson, looking over at Guinness and talking distribution. So we wanted to understand this distribution of the difference of the means of two things. Divide by the standard error, and he figures out what distribution that follows. So typically follows. You have to be careful when you do this stuff. So sometimes people think divided by some version of standard error, that's key distributed. There are conditions. And so he figures out what they are. And what he uses it for is quality control in making Guinness um, stout. So stout is beer. And he wants to make sure that the mash that they make to make the beer is the same all the time. So he's always doing a comparison. So 
one step away from the F test, he gets instructed another decade later of doing everything simultaneously. Then in the 1940s, it really is those papers that are being referenced are talking about allegedly fault. So Alan Turing, Shaq Good. So that whole entourage in the imitation game. So if you want a popularized version of it, the imitation game is right. Um, saying that, it's not out. So, but it's a popularized version, I think it's pretty good. I still like it. So I knew people hanging out in Cut 8, spent time with them, and I got the real story. So if you ever want to compare notes on that, I'd love to do so. Okay. I mentioned last time, I'm just going to scroll. I guess I'm just going to go past all of my animation here. And we'll just get the big picture on this. But this is my tree of evolutionary thought. I want to say a few things about this. Um, let me see if I can stand up there. I should ask, do I need the microphone? What do you think? Let me know. So I'm worried about the microphone echoing in this thing, so I already get an echo. Um, anyway, we can figure it out. How do I sound over here? Probably better, right? So that's why I have it. Um, somebody's already pointed out that in my evolutionary tree, Laplace roots it. So he's the beginning. Um, some people say face, and that's totally fine. So it's, it's hard to say. You know, in history, there's different versions of things, depending on who the narrator is. I'll tell you about face in a moment. But I think Laplace is the one that understood the implications in Bayes' theorem that makes him a Bayesian. And so every statistician I know, everybody that's been through probability theory knows Bayes' theorem. And just because you use Bayes' theorem doesn't mean you are a Bayesian. Everybody adheres to Bayes' theorem. It's a probability. So it's the application and the way in which you use it that makes you a Bayesian. So as a probability rule, no controversy. So is an inferential tool, well, people have to understand what it means and what you're doing with it and what the implications are. I think Laplace is the one that got this and was doing Bayesian analysis. A lot of people will say all the Laplacian assumptions, sometimes you hear people say that, and they're talking about things like flat or diffuse priors. Laplace didn't have a firm grasp on theory that gave us priors, so that we could um, derive priors or priors for certain properties. Saying that, he was more sophisticated than you think. So he did understand when doing variants, one over the scale parameter was a good prior, reference prior. How he knew it, I don't know. So he never says, but he used it. And that's why, that's why I kind of credit him. He's starting to see it as the way we do it now. Um, saying that, HISPA, the International Society for Bayesian Analysis, spends $1,000 every year to go clean Thomas Bayes' grave. So I've asked, why don't we go clean Laplace's grave too while we're at it? Because doesn't he deserve something? So I think we get real caught up in why things are called a certain way. What is the, the convention behind the naming of the field? Why isn't it called Laplacian statistics? So all very interesting. You have a paper online that helps to helps you to understand that. I can never talk about anything without talking about the complement of it. I always need to know what's on the other side. So I know relatively how things are different. So these are not Bayesian. So it's unclear who all of them are in terms of their paradigm of thinking. So it's, a lot of people say frequentist, but Fisher wasn't always a frequentist. He was doing regularization and doing things that didn't have frequentist problems sometimes. He did advocate it in terms of using, um, in terms of driving estimators, but it was almost as though 
when he did decision theory, he didn't care about the frequentist interpretation of a p-value, that is, if it ducks alpha, and the null hypothesis is correct, and you reject the hypothesis, you do that at rate alpha. So if alpha was 5%, p-value is 0.04, you reject it, you have a 5% error rate if your model is correct. And you've conditioned on the true null hypothesis. That will have a uniform distribution. So, Leanna's qualified to answer question. So, what? Um, Naaman and Pearson gave the p value frequentist interpretation. And Fisher went to war with it, did not like that. So, Fisher's color was a frequentist. Naaman and Pearson didn't always act that way. They never used the tool. But they were trying to help Fisher, was my understanding of it. So this is, Egon Pearson is the son of Carl Pearson. Carl Pearson and Fisher kind of grew up in the same neighborhood. Not literally, but they're both going to Cambridge, getting their PhDs saying things about statistics. They're both geneticists as well. And so they start carving out the field from kind of an applied genetics basis. So that's the context they're working in. And they don't agree with each other on quite a number of things. Um, apparently, Carl Pearson didn't like Fisher very much. And he tells the Royal Society, he cannot be a member, he should reject all his papers. Things like that. I wasn't there. But it sounds pretty feisty. Fisher goes to Wacom's staff and becomes an ad engineer. He's looking at fertilizer on plots, you know, that sort of thing. And that becomes sort of the basis of statistics as well. A lot of statistics programs are in ag schools. Our department was in an ag school until the College of Science of Old. So it was seen as a way, a tool to help research workers. And in fact, that's what Fisher titled it. So statistical methods for research workers, and there are a lot of ad experiments. Carl thinks he's done with Fisher, but Fisher rises to prominence. So he's back in the game. He comes up with the idea of utilizing key values in about 1925. It was before that, but that's when he starts getting recognized for it. Egon Pearson, years later, looking at this thing, wants to understand what the key value means. The probability of extreme data, given the null hypothesis, is true, and your model is true. So uh, everything is true. What does it mean? Okay. You know, the probability of the data I saw in more extreme data is 47%. What does that mean about your data? And so if it's arbitrarily small, then it think, you would think probably your model is so if I saw something way off in the extremity, and that's the rationale for using a key value. That's what they tell everybody in Scott 101. So it makes sense, it makes sense, let's move, move on. Um, Egon said not so fast. We need to understand this in terms of errors, making decisions have errors. So with Maiman, they write about it. Fisher doesn't like it, and they never get along after that. Egon, I, the way the history is written is he was a little baffled by the whole thing, but he had to have done it. I'm not sure. Um, here are your Bayesians. So Jeffries comes in in the 50s, and he's looking at Bayesian analyses, and he likes the idea that anything you're uncertain about, put a probability distribution on. That's what a posterior does. So Bayesian is using Bayes' theorem to put a probability on the things they don't know, in condition on the things that they do know. So in a nutshell, that's what a Bayesian is after. Probability distribution on the things you do not know. Keep in mind that's different from the PIVA. Probability distribution of your data and more extreme data conditioned on a parameter set or a set of parameters or whatever. So the Bayes thing is flipping that and saying conditional on your data, here's what you think about the parameters. And we'll get there in a moment. Jeffries likes the idea, that makes sense to him, but is aware that the prior can't just be arbitrary, and people were writing about it saying, your personalized product. These are your personalized probabilities. Now, saying that, our probability 
these hardware. We build different models, all of that. So it's not just the prior. It's the likelihood, the model too, the whole thing. I usually call all of it the model. Some people call the likelihood functions the model and the prior is the prior. The whole thing to me is the model. All of it is we're doing our best effort to figure out what it all is. Trying to understand what our inference is being. Jeffrey starts at the prior and says we need a methodology so that if we all have the same sampling functions and likelihood functions, subsequently, they're different and similar. We'll get to that in a moment. But they are different creatures. They might look the same on a chalkboard, but fundamentally they're different spaces in which they operate in. Jeffrey says let's start with the prior. Given that we all agree on the sampling mechanism of the data, I can give you some objective rationale for choosing priors. And he tried a whole bunch of stuff. There is a prior that's attributed to its name, the Jeffries prior, and we'll be getting to that in a couple of weeks. So I use them. Everybody uses them. They're still useful. And they kind of gotten rid of some of the things other people were saying. So like James, similar. I didn't bring my book by James. Maybe we'll get to books later and we can look at some books. Um, he had an entropy prior that was trying to do something similar. It's a physicist. The Jeffries prior mostly won out, simply because of the complexity of it. Um, similar in some cases, the same in some cases, different in some cases. As the dimensionality starts changing in a problem, people start to diverge in their agreement. There's no difference. So you have to be more careful in high dimensional spaces than in low dimensional spaces. We'll be getting into all of that. Dave Panetti writes a foundational text on probability theory, and it strongly reinforces Bayesian thought. Um, he starts trying to add credibility. So we need a mathematician working in this stuff, so the mathematicians will take us seriously. So it used to be that all of probability theory was for gamblers, so you can go and beat people at games and make some money. Parlor tricks. And mathematicians thought, you know, this is the bratty little brother of anything like meaningful. And so, what is this stuff? Get out of here. And then people figured out how to use Quantifying uncertainty is a necessary thing when you're working with data. And so, Dave Meddy starts formalizing everything. There was a quote on my web page. It's first page of his book, I should bring that one in as well, try to make it there. He says probability does not exist. Somebody wrote me in a nice email about the whole thing. Who was that? Awesome. So I kind of agree. So can you tell us your name? PJ. PJ. Is that right? Yeah. We'll get it there. Um, she said that I think it's because probability is a man-made construct. So, and I kind of agree with that. So I don't think he was trying to ever say this is the way in which the world actually operates. It's a measuring stick that we use to measure things. So, and it's on a scale between zero to one and it can mean different stuff depending on how you calibrate it. Again, this isn't reality, but it's useful. I think that's what you kind of articulated to me. And that's my understanding. I think it's a nice measurement stick. There's some nice properties in the rule. Um, I don't care if you think about this as something that's fundamentally true or if it's an engineering construct. Uh, it could be either one to you. And if you look at the other side, you'll start to see that both things are kind of true simultaneously. It's like there is some elegant stuff that's going on here. It's also got some nice heuristic built into it. And we'll talk about it in both lenses. But David A. tries to give credibility to everything. Jack Good was in the statistics department here for a quarter of a century after working with Alan Ford. Couldn't talk about any of his advances for 30, 40 years because they were all confidential, top secret stuff. Jack knows something about Bayesian statistics, was talking about it for 20 years. And he starts wanting to name things. This conversation with Savage about all of this. 
Savage at, at the University of Chicago, they get together. I think that they, no matter how you look at this, and there's many answers to this question I've asked, who came up with Bayesian statistics, who coined it, who popularized it, those two deserve some credit. So they deserve a lot of credit, I think. Lindley, Dennis Lindley comes in a little bit later, starts seeing what everybody's doing, and he is absolutely adamant that all things not Bayesian are now incorrect. It's not the right way to think about it. You're confused. Blah, 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 blah. So he goes on a mission to set everybody straight. And I think that, you know, when I grew up learning about Bayesian statistics, and I was even asked, if I asked the wrong person, tell me about Bayes, <laughs> they might slap me. So how dare you come in here with that? That would help the person. So it's like, can we talk about MC and season? <laughs> No, you can't even do that. Some people were very opposed to Bayesian statistics for a long time, and we all know it. Controversial, what's your prior? Those are, that's not a good question. What's your model? It's a good question if you like that, and operating in a probability space, it doesn't sound so bad on its own. But I think some of this is attributed to Fisher and Lindley fighting with each other. In fact, they were both here at Virginia Tech on the fourth floor having an argument. And eventually in class, I'll bring you a small transcript of that argument that took place. That likely the functions. Then we get something great. But I think that Fisher and Dennis Lindley's antagonistic way of arguing things probably contaminated everybody for about 40 or 50 years. Now when I meet people, it's like, so are you Bayesian or a frequentist or something else? And they're like, bit of both. Bit of, and it's no fun anymore. It's like, oh my goodness. Can we get you guys excited with it? No. So everybody very practical. They're going to see how things operate and work in different applications and try to explain differences and all that. It's very rational. So I think that is the attitude of most researchers these days. Um, Adrian Smith, along with Alvin Gelfand, write the Gibbs sampling paper. Gibbs sampling had been around before that, Geeman and Geeman over in Brown University, working on electrical engineering. They're looking at markup random fields. They're looking at images. They're trying to model and classify things like that. Um, they kind of realized something Metropolis and Hastings had said years before. It starts getting popularized in the 90s. Jim Berger comes in with kind of a re-elocution of all of decision theory in a Bayesian lens. And things start getting modernized with computational approaches for solving the problems instead of just arguing about them. So that's my very, very coarse history on everything. But I think it's always important to understand why people did things previously. And does that apply to us anymore? It's certainly true that we like to say, well, I did it because they did it 45 years ago. And then the guy 40, 44 years ago did it. And then the person after that did it. And then, so people do it, right? So I'm allowed to do it. Um, eventually, that argument gets too old. And I think it's good to question what were they doing in the first place. So I like to study this. We'll do a little bit of that now, so we good. The basis there. And yeah, that's it. That's what it is. I have it written down in terms of sets. I'm sure you all recognize the notation. But it says this. The probability of A, so the probability of A, and this says given or conditioned on whatever's to the right-hand side of the bar. So probability of A given B is equal to this thing. Now, I don't want you to worry about the denominator real quick. But this is the flip of that. So probability of B given A, and then it's multiplied by the probability of A. So what that says to me in the numerator is probability of B given A and a, simultaneously. 
So what it really means in the numerator is the probability of B and A. And anybody that's taken any probability class knows that's what it means. The bottom is just a normalizer. It's normalizing everything. So I have everything really simply stated as there's a set A and then there's the other stuff, the complement. If you're going to talk about one thing, you've got to talk about both of them. Bayesian posterior is always with respect to both things. So it's normalized by the whole entire space. Notice the key value does not do that. It doesn't take into account the alternative space and the null space simultaneously. When we get into decision making, the denominator will be expressed with both things. So everything is always relative to everything else. That's a very big difference in Bayesian thinking than some other types of statistics. I like that because I am a relative sort of person. So everything to me is relative compared to what? And so we've got both A and complement of A baseline everything. And this is a true probability statement. It's completely uncontroversial. You usually have you work through something like this in a discrete space to have you um, understand it. In continuous spaces, this is true too. We have to work in limits to make everything work. And the rate of limits can change things. So if you want a good problem where you're trying to understand how um, it matters how you get there and not where you go, Burrell's paradox is really good. So it's in Kasselenberger, I'll just let you make a note of it. But the rate at which things approach things does matter. Certainly beyond the scope of discussing this form of Bayes' theorem. This is good enough for us for right now. That's Bayes' theorem, everybody used to. Um, I can attribute a few different things to A and B and just see if it all makes sense, but I think this rule makes sense to most of us. So, the bottom, the denominator says, basically probability of B. Let me see if I can get my dot cam working and maybe write a little bit. I'm inclined to go run to my whiteboard right now that I don't have. So I'm going to try something new. Try out the dot cam.
that's the way that it was written in that stuff. All this is saying right here, this chunk right here is the probability of P given A. to always say a burger and a chocolate shake. And people said to me that they didn't like burgers and chocolate shakes, and I thought to myself, well, I do like chocolate shakes, but it's hardly my favorite shake. So since I'm just going to pick things that are relevant to me, this is what I would order if I went to a fast food place. So chicken sandwich and a strawberry shake. I haven't been to one in months, so I'm craving it here. So let's just let those sets represent this. And I'll just say this is the act of buying these things. So when I say chicken sandwich, I mean I buy it. I've got a chicken sandwich. So these are events that happen. And so let's just look at this right here. This part is just saying that let me rearrange. I'm going to give you a I'm going to rewrite this slightly differently. Probability of B given A times the probability of A is equal to the probability of A given B. And I'm going to multiply by the denominator on both sides times the probability of B. So this equation. Right there is this exact same equation. They're the same things. And this says the probability of B and K. This is equal to the probability of A and B. So I want to say a few things about that. So the left-hand side says, if I just think about the events, I'm going to buy a chicken sandwich. Probability operator is the probability of that happening, but the event is me buying a chicken sandwich. So on the left hand side it says, I'm going to buy the chicken sandwich if I buy the strawberry shake. That's what this says. This says, and. When I multiply, it's and. So, you can deal with the case. You need to figure this out. One fourth of one fourth is one sixteenth if you multiply them. And I'm going to get the strawberry shake. So what's the event? It's the event of me getting the chicken sandwich and the strawberry shake, and this is the probability. On the right hand side, this, is, this says, I'm going to get the strawberry shake if I get the chicken sandwich. And I'm going to get the chicken sandwich. So what this says is I'm going to get both of them. On both sides. So I can set it up differently. I'll get the chicken sandwich if I get the strawberry shake and I'm getting the strawberry shake. What I just said, very complicated way of saying I'm getting both of them. I can do it in the opposite order. It's the same thing. If I buy the chicken sandwich, I'll get the strawberry shake and I buy the chicken sandwich. What I just say I buy both of them. So that phase is theorem in a nutshell. So 
We'll play around with that rule all the time. Saying that, that is not what makes you amazing. It's operating under this rule. That's what confuses a lot of us because we go to our Step 101 class, they have us operate, they tell us what the prior probability is, they tell us what the conditional probabilities are, and they ask you to figure out the posterior flip. Everything. Flipping a conditional. And if somebody handed you all of those probabilities, you would do exactly that. There's no other choice. So it doesn't make you something when it's the only thing to do. So I want to say a little bit about this before we talk about what a Bayesian actually does. Oops. Do this. This is Bayes' theorem. That's what Bayes came up with. But it's not exactly what a Bayesian does. Okay, if I just gave you those probabilities of me buying chicken sandwiches, conditioning on strawberry shakes, and I asked you to flip the conditional, you would be able to do it. So if I gave you three probabilities, you would be done. So I can give those to you in all kinds of different ways in disguise. It's got one one class. Give them to you in all kinds of different ways so you have to form those probabilities. Unfortunately, Bayes passed away before he led on to his understanding of his rule. I should also mention the paper is on the department's website, Bayes' paper. You will not see any mathematical expression that looks even remotely like that. And it's very difficult to, uh, to understand what happened back in the past. So you really almost do need a historian to mine this rule out there. So they wrote differently. They have different methods for writing down the symbols, so on and so forth. But they certainly did not have a link in. They also didn't speak like that. We'll see that in a moment. So an essay by Richard Price to John Canton. Does anybody know what FRS stands for? Fellow, yeah, fellow of the Royal Society. So he's writing a passage to his friend over in the Royal Society. They're both members. So this is prominent stuff from back then for sure. Dear sir, read December 23rd, 1763. So this is that 1760s thing we saw pop up in the blank. Everything surrounding this event. It's changed the universe. Well, it changes a small part of the universe. But it changes what we're learning today. And I'll send you an essay which I have found among the papers of our deceased friend, Mr. Bayes, in which, in my opinion, is great merit and well deserves to be preserved. Experimental philosophy, you will find, is nearly interested in the subject, subject of it. I think he means that complimentary. So, not the way we speak today. And on this account, there seems to be particular reason for thinking that a communication of it to the Royal Society cannot be improper. Like that. That your inquiries may be rewarded with many further successes and that you may enjoy every valuable blessing is the sincere wish of Sir, your very humble servant, Richard Price. As mentioned, people spoke to him. Um, every time I read that, it makes my heart flutter. So I'll pull cool. it. Um, I've never seen anybody like anything like this in my 45 years of existence. Okay, this is what happens. He passes on the transcript from Thomas Bayes after he passes away. And it eventually gets published. People start talking about it. But this is what I'm saying with Laplace. Laplace kind of transformed the way we were using it. People have told me Bayes knew this and understood it. And I believe it. So I just don't, I haven't been totally convinced that this is the thing that sparked the wildfire. I think it's Laplace seeing it and telling everybody about it, doing it, is what made everything happen. But ultimately, this is how a Bayesian physically operates. So I'm going to ask some common notation in this class, B for data, sometimes I call it big X. I do that a lot. Sometimes I call it X and Y if they're paired. So, but ultimately we have data. And 
We've got parameters in our models. I'll give you an example in a moment, but I'm going to call our parameters arbitrarily theta. That could represent a whole array of parameters. They could all be scalars, they could be vectors, they could be matrices, they could be topologies. It could be anything. So whatever your parameters represent. And what a Bayesian does with this is they flip everything around. Now I want to talk about this notation. I'm trying to say likelihood, and this is not the way I usually write. And there's all these different ways of writing down likelihoods, notationally. But when I write it this way, it looks like basis here in the skies. So instead of summing, since I'm working in a continuous space, I use my continuous sum operator integration. Thank you, Newton. So who gets bread? Who gets? Right? So it's like, it looks like they're both coming up with stuff at about the same time. So no need to buy it over it. But history is kind of sometimes contaminated by animosity rather than just the contribution that they're open for the game. Anyway, thank you, Knutin, teaching us how to add things together that have been by this. Um, and they're just normalizing. Ultimately, this number down here. It's a number that does not depend on theta. I know I've written theta here, but keep in mind, I've averaged it out. So it's just like our old equation where I wrote down this thing as probability of E in the denominator. A is really dull. It's been marginalized out of the equation, averaged over. So the denominator is not a function of theta. Theta has been averaged out. So this is really proportional to this thing, the likelihood times the product. And that's the base theorem. It's giving me the probability distribution of theta given to Now, I just made a mistake. That shouldn't be an R right there because it's not a probability, it's a density function. Something like that. So I can turn the densities into probabilities. So this is just kind of an educational challenge that we're always going into in these classes. Is it little f? Is big f? Is there an R's or not? So I'll try to be consistent, but as you can tell, my attempt will be evil. So I'll try to talk you through everything when we introduce notation that we use again. I think it'll look like every one of your other sets. So, um, but in a nutshell, that's everything. That's it. So let me say a few things in the last few minutes. Try to write some of this down, and we'll come back to this next time. Okay, sampling distribution. This is what I normally write down. Okay, so let's just do some basic notation. I'll say di is distributed according to some function, has a dummy argument d in there, representing its position in space, given theta. A lot of times I use x's, but I'll try to just use d right now for the data. Okay. So, and I'm going to say just for nicety's sake, this is iid. Now, Bayes' inference doesn't just conform to iid distributions. We'll go into that soon. There really isn't much of a difference. It's just going to make things easier how I can go data thing right now. But what this means. There's some distribution right here of data. Okay, I'll make D continuous just for my collection right now, but it could have been a discrete history. Okay, so I'm just going to write down that there's some distribution. Oops. A little wrong. Could have been discrete. Could be continuous. Maybe we can get away with this without being specific right now. But this thing right here, the shape, is modeled by this function. So that function is this shape right here in continuous space or the heights of these points in the street space. Distribution, density. Which one are we saying? Usually we use those words for continuous or discrete spaces. I'll often say distribution. But if we're in a continuous space, I mean density. Okay? It's not going to change the rules. 
and working through a bunch of examples will be helpful. So doing an example next time might be the best thing to do. Here's what I believe in. I'm going to write down that the likelihood function, and I'm going to get i goes from 1 to n. We'll come back to this principle in first step next time. I'm going to sample n, or n data points from this distribution. So I'm going to reach in with height proportional to the density function or probability proportional to the height of the bar in the discrete space, and I'm going to just sample n points out of there. I'll say that again next time. So I'm going to get a whole collection of these. I'll say d is equal to d1 down to dn. And the way we'll get our posterior, or our likelihood function, I'm going to write this as proportional to, we'll talk about the proportionality symbol Next time, if this is just F D e, I given theta. So on paper, that looks like it's proportional to the joint sampling distribution of these, but I'm calling it a likelihood function. So here's the difference. I'm plugging in the these that I actually have in here, and I'm thinking of it as a function of theta. Let's come back to that next time. If we can't get this part, we're going to be stuck forever. So I want to slow down for a moment. Thanks for your patience going over a minute. Um, try to give you some of your time back as we go. But that's all I have for right now. If you guys have questions, queue up in an orderly manner or stay in your seat and I'll take you. Thank you.